was unexpected. That's nice. Let's start every day just like that. So I'll go back there and you can welcome me uh, up here. This is a new space, which is great. They said, uh, we're going to put you in the new space. It sounds good. Said it's going to be the nursery. <laughs> sounds fitting. This is good. Uh, we'll just roll with it. If you need something, raise your hand, head out to the bathroom. This is going to be uh, as low key as we can make it. Uh, and we'll see where throughout the week here I've got some stuff planned for uh, for today and then uh, we're gonna leave a little bit of time at the end I hope usually when someone says that from uh, presenter spot they never leave time at the end but let's try to leave a little bit of time on the end because I want to hear where you want to go with this for the rest of the week and that's really important to me because this is community and I want us to be a community uh, that also means some interaction too so there might be uh, a few times especially a little bit later in the week where I ask for some interaction and let's have some discussion and some interaction in a space like this. I mean, it's so conducive to be able to do that as well. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah. That's the interaction that I'm talking about. So not just head nods, go ahead and uh, give me something. Everyone hear me okay? Yes. yes. Awesome. We're going to start, uh, just give you a little bit of info about me since uh, you're going to be hearing me talk uh, a fair bit uh, this week as well. So you can get to know me and um, we'll, we'll do a little bit of this maybe each day as well. But uh, here's a picture of my family. So that's me. And I just now realized I'm wearing exactly the same thing today <laughs> as that. Should have changed that. Uh, this is my wife, uh, Sarah. We've been married for 13 years. Uh, she's absolutely amazing, a nurse. We live up in the Twin Cities. We've had ventures all over the country. Uh, it's, it's been a blast. We have a five-year-old or soon-to-be five-year-old son, Finley, uh, who's just a riot. I wish he could have been here. I mean, you would have got a kick out of him for sure because he would talk more than me for sure. He wakes up talking. He goes to bed talking everywhere in between. If there's some empty space, he's going to fill it. And he's got questions. He would ask you guys questions that you wouldn't be able to answer for sure and makes you think. So I love, I love, love, love that. Uh, 2020 has been a tough year uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, it's had all kinds of different changes, but the best thing about 2020 is that Finley told me one night, uh, a couple of months ago, he said, Dad, I think I'm ready to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Man, let me tell you, as a dad, all the things that we have talked about since he was born at little five pounds, we call him our five pound sack of sugar. He was just this little tiny thing uh, praying for that evening. 2020 is the best year ever. Despite all the other things, 2020 is the best year ever. Just because of that. And then this is Adeline. Uh, Adeline is going to be two in October. And she's a lot like me, which scares me a little bit, but also gets me pretty excited. She's pretty go with the flow and is certainly sweet uh, as well. Um, this picture, it's got Christmas trees in the background. So a little bit about our family is I've got all kinds of pictures of our kids. I mean probably too many pictures of our kids and some pictures of mom and the kids we got pictures of me and the kids but getting a photo of us all together is like nearly impossible so two things is one we probably need to make it a priority to make time for a family photo like this one which was i'm sure snapped in a hurry anyway around december uh and then uh two um man, we, we got we to gotta figure out how to uh, actually ask my wife if we have an updated photo, because I didn't do that. And I'm sure she's probably got an updated family photo from somebody. So there's a little bit about our dynamic is that I run a million miles a minute. And if I would have just slowed down a little bit and just talked to my wife and said, hey, here's one of the things I could really use for the conference is maybe an updated photo that you approve of. That'd be great. So this is being videoed. Hey to everyone who's uh, on the video, by the way. Um, hope this is as much of a time for you as anything. And Sarah, if you're watching this, sorry I didn't ask if this was an approved photo. Little disclaimer. Uh, a little more about me as well. I am the owner and lead consultant with a uh, consulting company. We focus on churches and nonprofit organizations. It's called Fifth Gen Consulting. 5G leadership, fifth gen consulting. If you can't tell, I'm pretty passionate about what we're going to be talking about this week. The website is fifthgenconsulting.org. So if you have some time this week or after you leave conference here, 
and you want to poke around on that website, there's some free materials. Some of the materials we're going to go over this week I uh, have on there as well and, uh, and some videos uh, that I put out fairly regularly. And so um, that's, uh, that's the website. And then my email is travis at fifthgenconsulting.org. That's important because if you have questions as you leave here, whether it's you leave here today and you're like, oh, you know, here's something I'd really love to know before I leave conference. Or maybe it's in a couple of weeks and you're thinking through uh, this experience together. You're like, man, I really just have some questions. What was that resource that he was talking about? Just send me an email. I'm happy to get back in touch with you and get you what, uh, what would be helpful for sure. So that's the best way to get a hold of me, Travis at fifthgenconsulting.org. A little more about me too is that I spent 19 years at and uh, that's between California and the Twin Cities. So those have kind of been the two places that we've, uh, that we've landed in, uh, in our ministry. So 19 years as a pastor. Most recently, I was with Eagle Brook Church, and I led the Blaine campus, and uh, we live just north of Blaine. Uh, and so many of you are familiar with Eagle Brook. Uh, that's where I was uh, all the way up until um, February. February. And then I also sit on the board of directors with a nonprofit based out of the Twin Cities called the Lead Now Initiative. Again, more leadership. I, uh, I kind of sit on the nonprofit. Um, a great, um, great organization as well. I'm honored to be a part of that, and it's a, uh, it's a great one. So you can go to leadnow.org if you want more information about Lead Now as well. There's a little bit about me. I want to hear a whole lot about you. And so as we go throughout this, I may ask your name or what your background is. I may ask uh, a little more about um, what demographic, what generation you fit into. I'm kind of looking around the room here and we have a few generations present, but I'm guessing that our fingers reach out to generations that are a lot broader than what's even represented in this room. So look forward to, uh, to getting into that. All right, I've got three more things that are kind of quick hitters that you should probably know about me before we get started. The first one is that I love coffee. <laughs> I love coffee. This morning I got up, I went for a bike ride, and then I had coffee. And then I drove on the way in here, and I was like, oh, look, there's a coffee shop. You know, I got some time. And then, you know, we had a little bit of time, you know, after this morning, before this, and I thought, you know, let's just walk down. There's a little coffee shop around the corner. I know, because I scoped it out earlier. So I have coffee with that. I really do. I love coffee. The second thing is that I write with both hands. I write with both hands. And so I've got some uh, ability to do some whiteboarding on this if we get there. And if you look at the handwriting and sometimes it's one way and sometimes it's the other, it's because I just pick up the pen and just start writing. So both hands. Neither of them are very legible, so I'm going to try to not write a whole lot. But that's a little bit about me. And the third thing is that I love talking about and I love developing leaders. I mean, I truly do. It, it, there's a few things that really get me out of bed in the morning. My family is certainly one of them. But developing leaders gets me excited in the morning. Multiplying leaders and helping leaders reach their potential, I mean, it gets me fired up. So if I start talking about this stuff and I get passionate, it's because I'm passionate. This is what God's put inside me. I'm also Greek, and so that passion kind of comes out a few times as well. But talking about leadership is what we're going uh, to do uh, a fair amount. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's why you're here. Here's a statement that I wrote that I want us to just take a moment and let this simmer in. I don't know if you believe this, but my hope is that by the end of this, you do. I think that everyone in this room, that we are all leaders. All of us. I truly believe that. I believe that everyone in this room is a leader in some capacity. Now, before I said that, would you have classified yourself as a leader? Some of you would, some of you wouldn't. So let's see a show of hands, because this is participation. Let's keep that little theme going. Before walking in these doors today, how many of you would say, yeah, I would classify myself as a leader? Raise your hand. Not even half the room. Maybe half the room. So my hope is that as we leave here at the end of the week, that not only do you understand why I believe that every one of us here is a leader, but man, that you have hope and that you believe yourself that you are a leader. We're going to talk about five generational leadership. 
And what, what does it look like to live in a world where there's five generations of people present before we even get into any of that generational stuff? I think it's pretty clear with only half the room believing what I truly believe, we should maybe start there. So that's where we're gonna uh, go with, uh, with the first part of this here today. Here's a statement, and it's a big one. No matter your age, position in work or life, your personality, your spiritual gifts, whatever else you choose to put on this list, you can fill in the blank for you. I believe that not only are we all leaders, but the leadership is each of our call. Nobody walked out, which is really good. <laughs> I hope you're still tuned in on the video. Don't leave yet. I'm going to say this again. No matter your age or your position in work or in life, your personality, whatever else you choose to add to that list, because again, that's you. What I believe is that not only are, are we all leaders, every one of us, but the leadership is actually in each of our calling. Man, I could just sit there and just sink in. Let's go to the Bible. It's a good place to start. So if you brought your Bible, open it up. Or if you have a Bible app, do that. We're going to start at the very beginning in Genesis 1-1. Because that's a good place to start, if you ask me. And most of us know uh, this story. I think, honestly, we could walk down the street and just find somebody random and say, hey, do you know what is at the beginning of the Bible? And, you know, depending on what their background is, they may be able to, to tell you if we gave them a little bit of prompts. Hey, it was like in the beginning, God did something. They could probably tell you what we're just about to read here. All right. I truly believe this. But this is so foundational and such a great place to start in understanding why each of you are leaders. Okay, here it is. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless, empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was? Come on now, this is a participation thing, right? God saw that the light was? Good. God said, this is uh, verse 6, God said, let there be an expanse between the waters. Verse 9, God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place, let dry ground appear, and it was so. Man, I wish I could have seen that. And then later in verse 10, and God saw that it was? Come on now. Verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from night, and it was so. And verse 18, God saw that it was? Yeah. And God said, this is 20, God said, let the water team with living creatures, let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. Verse 21, God saw that it was? And God blessed them. I love that part. I have that highlighted. And God blessed them. Verse 24, God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, and it was so. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. That's God, Trinity, triune God, in our image. That's the, the language that we read there. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and he blessed them. And it was so. Verse 31, God saw all that he had made. He didn't just say it was good. He said it was very good. Very good. I don't know about you, but if I can think of a great leader that walked the face of this planet. It'd be Jesus. Anyone disagree with that? Greatest leader ever to walk the face of this planet. Jesus was there in the beginning. We are made in his image. The spirit of God who raised him from the dead. New power. It's in you. It was there at the beginning. You were created in his very image. Man, if we can reflect the image of God, we're reflecting leadership, among so many other things. Let's get to the New Testament. Ephesians 1.18. 
This is the theme of our conference, by the way. You'll see this throughout. The theme is Eyes of Faith, 2020 Vision. Ephesians 1.18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. So when I say leadership is in your calling, it fits right in with our theme for this conference. I pray that you are enlightened to the hope that you have as leaders. I've been praying that over you guys over the last few days. Ephesians 2.10. This came up in our prayer time this morning over just right next door. We are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. When he created you in his image, he created you as his masterpiece. That carries a lot of weight with it, by the way. I feel a lot of responsibility knowing that God looks at me as his masterpiece. And I want to live a life that honors that, where he looks down and goes, yeah, yeah, well done. Let's keep going in Ephesians. Ephesians 4.1. Paul says this, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. And then he gives you a little list here. Be humble and gentle and patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. There's that calling and hope put together again when you of the calling. It's important for us to talk about leadership and it being part of your calling. And this is one reason. One. 28. This is the Great Commission. We should know this. We should know what's in Matthew 28. This is what we're here for. Father and the Son you, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the commandment, which when Jesus was questioned, what's the God? And the other one's like this, love your neighbor. Love God and love others. no matter your age or position in life, your personality, your spiritual gifts, or whatever else you choose to put on that list. He created me in his very image, and then he declared over you, and he declared over me that we are very, us and just they will know who Jesus is. They will know that we are his disciples because of evident in our lives. We'll pour that out onto others. And they'll go, what is happening here? Of me different than I've been loved or maybe even not loved before. I wrote down in my notes right here, drop the mic. I don't have one. Can't really. I mean, it's over here. And then we'll keep rolling this morning. And God, uh, what an immense responsibility and also privilege it is to live lives worthy of the calling that we receive from you as you created us. Man, as you created us in your very image to do amazing things. 
and to love the world around us. That's so important right now in this time. And so I pray that we would do that and we would do that well and that it wouldn't just be about the love that we give to people, but that it would point them to you, that they would know who you are and that we would be leaders in our homes and in our workplaces and in our communities by simply loving first. Thanks for loving us right from the get-go. We love you back. Amen? Amen. I feel like we could just stop right there. Like that was, that's good for me. Uh, but we are going to talk about generational leadership, five generational leadership. And uh, there's all kinds of places that we could go with this whole thing. If, you, if I'd have said maybe four years ago, if I'd have been sitting here and I said, Man, we are in unprecedented times. I think that most of you probably nod your head. Like, yeah, I think we're in unprecedented times. The things that are happening, you know, right now, again, we're four years ago. The things that are happening, you know, right now, um, they're unprecedented. They haven't really happened before. We've got some changes in life, right? But when I say sitting here today in 2020, man, we are living in unprecedented times. I mean, that carries a whole different weight with it. It really does. I mean, we're sitting here in the middle of this pandemic globally. That's changed how we function, how we do life, how we communicate with each other, how we do community with each other, or how we don't. I mean, self-quarantining, isolation, and everything that that brings with it, that's unprecedented. Absolutely unprecedented. But I also think that this is an unprecedented time because never before in history have we had five generations of people who regularly interact with each other. Hence the reason why I put out there 5G leadership. Regular, on a regular basis, right now, we have five generations of people who regularly do life together. Here's a few things I wrote down with that. I just, again, think through this all the time. What are some things that come uh, to mind for me? Um, five generations of family bringing all of their crazy together. That's my family. I mean, four generations of crazy Greek people getting all together. That's too much. That's, that's too much. Five generations. I mean, we're on, we're on a rocky road. This, this could be another unprecedented time, right? Five generations of bringing all that craziness together, five generations in our workplaces. Think about that. In our workplaces, employed by the working side by side a lot of times, sometimes younger people leading older people, sometimes older people leading younger people, five generations can all be present in the same exact workplace. Not happened before in history that we know about. Five generations in our communities. I think about um, going to the supermarket. You know, I think about driving down the highway and seeing the billboard ads. No longer are they geared toward me. I'm not their core demographic necessarily. Maybe one of the billboards, maybe a few of them. Maybe they try to cross some of the generations. But what we're seeing is that communication is having to like, span all five of these generations. There are times my son says something, and again, he's going to be five next month, right? He says something to me. He's like, oh, I remember seeing this on an ad on TV or, you know, why, why we we're driving down the billboard. Oh, that's the, um, you know, he, he gives the name of the store by the first letter. So like Northern Tool is, a, is right by our house. And so he calls that the N store. You know, it's got a big N on the outside of it, right? Now, Buffalo Wild Wings is on the other side. He calls it the B store, right? Um, and, and things stand out to him in a different way than they stand out to me. And people are marketing toward that, right? Yeah. Question. Yeah. You keep saying five generations. Are you talking 20 years? So for 100 years, people living longer, we're talking about age one. Yeah, we'll yeah we'll go through that. Yeah, we'll go through that in just a few minutes. I've got a chart here that kind of breaks down our uh, our generations of, of how they uh, how they go. So we'll we'll get there. I'm going to go back here just because of my notes uh, of where where we're going to be. But that's uh, that's certainly an intriguing uh, you know thing question. The reason why there's five generations all 
you know, uh, interacting with each other on a regular basis is because of how these generations line up. It probably won't uh, be the case here in a few more years uh, because we're going to have some of our maturest generations or traditionalists uh, moving out of the workforce and, uh, and retiring and moving on. Some of you are in the room, right? We're going to have younger generations coming up and not be at the age of being necessarily in, in a workforce for sure. Yeah. Uh, this is also important in our churches, by the way. We have five generations of people who are serving. I can tell you, having 19 years in ministry, that that is a challenge because you want to serve every one of them. And you have a heart to serve every one of them. Can you serve all those generations? Can one person serve all those generations in a smaller church? And if so, what's maybe the right demographic of These are all things that we have to think about if we're going to be effective in reaching people and in serving people. Five generations all together. And I wrote this down because the speed that our world is going in, so much changes every single day. So each of the generations that we'll talk about in a few minutes here has gone through life in a drastically different way. The effects of that is that we value different things. We need different type of communication. Yeah, pin drop on that one. A <laughs> different type of communication uh, that maybe will work best or not work at all. There's different communication methods for sure we'll talk about in a minute. And there's different, even different things that we just want out of life. Different generations want different things out of life. And there's some things that are the same through all the generations. We'll maybe get to some of those as well. So let's go to this chart that you were asking about. And we're going to take uh, a bit of our time today. This is going to be a little slower roll into this because I think it's important for us to level set, to all be on the same page and understand what these five generations look like and how some of this really plays in. Together we'll have just some uh, discussion and then uh, and there's all kinds of places that we can go through the rest of the week. So again, we'll try to leave a little bit of time here at, uh, at the end to be able to do some of that. Here's the chart for generations, and this is a generalized thing as well. And so some of the statements that are on here are generalized statements. They're not necessarily true for every single person from that generation, right? But uh, they are classifications that fit for most people in that generation. So the, the generations are maturists. Some, uh, some of these charts will give you traditionalists for that, uh, for that same Generation pre-1945, born pre-1945. So show of hands, who fits in that? Come on now. Pre-45. A few of us. Can I just say love you guys? Thank you so much for being here. Well, you got some wisdom that we're going to tap into this week. And we hope we can share some of that with you as well. So pre-1945, the next one is Baby Boomers, 1945 to 1960. And I can remember the first time uh, that I, well, the first time I remember hearing about um, Baby Boomers, uh, you know, as a, as a young adult, as maybe a, a you know, maybe fifth or sixth grade, and I'm going, Baby Boomers, that is the weirdest name for a generation. This is the generation, 1945 to 1960. Uh, and this is roughly so. Show of hands. Baby boomers. Not as many as I thought. Okay. Okay, that's good. Baby boom. Okay. Very good. Uh, Generation X, 1961 to 1980. Show of hands. Okay. Okay. 1981 to 1995, this could also be uh, labeled millennials, carries a different connotation than Gen Y to some of us, for sure. But uh, 1981 to 1995, Gen Y, show of hands. None? A lot of them that are in the uh, older end of that have kids and maybe can't be here with that. So if you're on uh, the video, we'll give a shout out back to you again. If you're uh, a millennial, if you're Gen Y, love you. Love you. Even if the world says something different. Uh, all right. Gen Z, born after 1995. One, two. We got a lot to learn from you guys. And we need you. Need you. You are the generation, not a generation coming up, but you are the generation. And man, if I could invest in two people 
I just could choose two people out of this whole room. Sorry, the rest of you. I love you. But I'd invest in you two gals. I really would. Love you. Absolutely. Uh, it's going to be fun for sure. Anyone not raise their hand? You wouldn't have raised your hand for that anyway. So <laughs> just keep going. Here's some aspirations. And this is uh, important because, again, it just kind of starts painting the picture of what does this look like to have five generations present and what are some of the things that go along with that. So aspirations for a maturist is home ownership. Think about the Great Depression, right? And coming out of the Great Depression, home ownership was something that a traditionalist or a maturist had an aspiration for. Think about my grandpa. I mean, his home, that was such an important thing for him. I remember him saying how many kids he brought home to a place that they rented and how many kids they brought home to their home. And that was an important time in their life. He was working so hard to be able to provide a home that he owned. And we talked about what that looked like and, and how that's important. It's one of the reasons why home ownership was an important thing for me is because, well, actually, he passed that down to me. That was part of the legacy that he passed down is uh, the importance of that in my life. It came from him. Home ownership was a big thing. Job security for baby boomers is one of the aspirations uh, of baby boomers. Job security. They wanted job security. Gen Xers, work-life balance. I cannot tell you how many times I have led staff meetings, staff retreats, workshops with other churches, staff, and we talk about the importance of work-life balance. I mean, I've read stacks of books about work-life balance. How do, we, how do we give everything to work and have balance in life, especially if your work is ministry, right? How do you, how do you turn that switch off and actually have some balance to be able to be healthy in life, healthy at home? That's such a hard thing. How many pastors are in the room? Any pastors at all? One. Love you. Work-life balance is such an important thing. Such an important thing uh, for you. Are you also a Gen Xer? You are. I love that. Okay, Gen Y, freedom and flexibility. If you think about millennials, if you had to think about an aspiration of a millennial, freedom and flexibility seems to fit to me. No surprise there. And then Gen Z, security and stability. The two gals agree with that? Still figuring it out. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, that's going to be a theme that may come back up multiple times through, uh, through this week. Yeah, that's good. Okay, let's, let's keep going on these characteristics. Attitude toward technology, because by the way, technology is all around us. I built this whole thing on a supercomputer tablet that's sitting right here, and it's through one cable connecting to this, and we're going to have it on uh, YouTube here at the end of the week. And technology is all around us. Love it or not, it's around us. So what, what is the attitude toward technology maturist? Largely disengaged, largely disengaged with it. Baby boomers, early IT adopters. That's important. Early information technology adapters. That's a big thing. And then digital immigrants for Gen X. Well, for, for Gen X, there's a lot of what we learned and uh, developed skills in happened in an analog world. But not much of what we do now is still in that analog world. So think about balance and checkbook, right? That was something that the Gen X and pre, right? They, they balance their checkbook, right? With a piece of paper and you know what I'm talking about here? Some of you look at me like, what's a checkbook? Okay. Uh, but how many people balance your checkbook in that fashion? And how many of you fall into that demographic of Gen Xers? One, right? Two? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, uh, that's really important. Most of what we learn, we learned in an analog way, but now we have uh, immigrated into this digital platform. And most of what we do is in the digital world. We do all online banking now. And I remember learning how to manage to the bank, you know, by getting our, the statements, by making sure my check is balanced. So I had to learn it two different times. And that, that's an important thing to think about because if you just move to the next generation, which is not so Gen Y, which by the way, I'm, uh, I'm a Gen Y, I'm a millennial, but I, I fall, I mean, right at the very beginning of this. And so if you kind of span or really close to maybe one of these uh, generational lines, you may lean toward one or the other, depending on how 
references are over the lines than others. So, yeah, that's most of what uh, your millennials are learning happens digitally first. I mean, never natives. And then Gen Z are technoholics. Technoholics. When I say we need to learn from you, we need to learn from you. We do. And here's the thing that you're going to find about Gen Z is that even though this is labeled technoholics, there's a lot of the Gen Z uh, demographic that really wants to move away from being so tech heavy. More so than the millennials. The millennials are like, well, yeah, we, we've seen the old way and this is so much better. Yeah. Under Yeah. Largely disengaged. Well, um, matures, a lot of them grew up in an era where uh, technology, the beginning of technology, um, was it was slow to be adopted. And, uh, and so it just wasn't something that was a value, especially in their formative years. It was an industrial uh, or an industrious type of environment around them. Uh, most of the people, especially on the early part of the maturist spectrum, um, aren't going to be the ones who uh, choose to online bank first or do most of their things online some absolutely will um, i think about uh, again my grandpa who fits into this uh demographic he doesn't own a computer still you know he has people come over to pay some of the bills that can only be paid online right um, and so this is a again a broad uh statement but um most of the time uh, you're going to find people in this demographic who are uh, fairly disengaged especially compared to the generations on the right side of this spectrum Agree or disagree? That's, this is a good time to take a break. I see some heads going, well, I'm not so sure. Pardon? Do you agree or disagree? And tell me why. Like, what, what's that look like? Partially was the answer if you're on the video. Talk about that. Unpack it a little bit. Well, I, I think folks, and I'm personally going to have to group around the asking, of course, but uh, I think it kind of depends upon their, uh, how they grew up, even within the maturist. Yeah. What they were, uh, you know, what, in terms of their learning processes and uh, those around them, depending on whether they accepted that. And, and uh, I, I think there are, I know, matures who, uh, if you look at them from the standpoint of they're probably more in the, the Y gen, at least X gen, in terms of their knowledge uh, and acceptability and interest in, uh, in using technology. Yeah. Love that. Anyone else in that generation who agrees with that or maybe doesn't? It's a safe zone, by the way. If you don't agree with that, that's, that's okay too. I agree. I've been yeah. Kind of yeah. I work for Verizon over 25 years. But... I'm with AT&T, sorry. I'm... <laughs> I said it was a safe zone. Now, you guys came together, I assume. Yeah. Anyone that didn't come with these two want to chime in on that? Anybody? Yeah. Since COVID has started, has started our church to do online services, yeah. we are seeing the gap in the church not being able to access sermons online yeah. because they just don't have the technology or the knowledge to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that knowledge is a big piece when I was uh, you know, talking about Gen Z and saying we need to learn from you. That knowledge is something that we need to learn from you. Some things that are native for you guys, even if you don't value it necessarily, it's just native to you. You know how to do this stuff. You know how to access something even if you've never gone there before. If it's online, you can probably figure it out pretty quickly. We need to learn from you of how to adopt some of that understanding and, and, uh, and foundation in order to be able to, um, to keep going. And likewise, the other way around, we need to figure out from you and learn from you, um, you know, mature us, uh, how to live without being reliant on that. Go ahead. I work with the uh, training, a lot of online training. I find that yeah. I work with a lot of uh, millennials. And I am really quite surprised to find out how little they do know about using technology. Mm -hmm. I do quite a bit of Zoom training, and some of the millennials are like, well, how do we do this? And what do I need to do? I'm thinking, well, you ought to be teaching me. Yeah. Yeah, interesting perspective, for sure. It's native to them. It's something that they've grown up with, for sure, but maybe they don't have a deep understanding of it. 
Yeah, in the I, bank. You know, I have parents that are insurance. Yeah. And um, the whole thing with online, it, it's fair. Fear of technology is what I see a lot in my parents. It's like, you know, fear of security. Is it secure? Is it, you know, can somebody, there's just a, and, and I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm an ex. You know, there's a little more balance. I mean, I, I like, I understand that everything isn't secure, but I don't. For the video, if you didn't hear that, I'm talking about the fear that's uh, associated with uh, technology and the level of that fear and, uh, and how that can affect uh, those maybe on the left side of this uh, spectrum, uh, for sure. That's good. Yeah. Trying to teach me. Yeah. And I do want to learn because I know that's the future. Yeah. That's good. Be eager. Learn what you need to. Sure. Of course, I'm in the church group and uh, I have friends that have a live stream now with all the churches closed. And some of them learn how to live stream, but they still can't hook up to their TV. Yeah. Just, so they go have the stuff, but they don't go all the way and get a nice big screen picture. Yep. Yep, often the case. Uh, enough to get by sometimes, right? But not necessarily adopt it or all the way, go all the way with it, be able to um, write comments. You know, if someone says, uh, hey, we want to pray for you, you just, you know, Right in the in the chat below, you know, and we would love to get in in touch with you. Maybe it's a maturist because well, I'm I'm watching it. That's a good step. I maybe want some prayer, but I don't know what he's talking about with the chat. So, you know, I'll just disengage from uh, from that part of it for sure. Let's keep moving here, uh, just for sake of time, and uh, through this. And again, this is just setting the framework for the rest of our week as well. But attitude toward career, we'll try to go uh, quickly through this part. Jobs are for life. That's a maturist. Jobs are for life. That's interesting. I think that there's a lot of people who would disagree with that. This is, I didn't create this graph, by the way. It's one that I reference um, fairly frequently and that there's others that are real similar uh, to it. But I think about, again, my grandpa. He's a commercial fisherman. When he uh, got done with high school, which, by the way, wasn't finishing high school, <laughs> when he was done with high school, he started fishing. And he's 96 now, I think, grandpa. Um, and he fishes. That's what he is. That is part of his identity. Right? He's a commercial fisherman. Jobs are for life. Attitude toward a career for a baby boomer. Um, organizational, right? So careers are defined by the employers. You may even move around within the, uh, within the company, some different roles, some different roles, but the, the place that you're employed was such an important part for baby boomers, where it's with Gen Xers, there are or early portfolio careers, which I'm still trying to unpack that a little bit. Again, I didn't create this, uh, this graph, but they're loyal to professions, not necessarily to the employer. So as a, uh, you know, as a Gen Xer, I am a, you know, whatever your title might be or whatever your skill set might be, but you may jump around, you know, from Google to or from Yahoo to Google, probably, right? And then to Bing and then back to Google because I'm not sure what Bing is anymore. And so on. But where you work is not as important as what you do with your work. Interesting there. Digital entrepreneurs, uh, we're talking about Gen Y now. Digital entrepreneurs work with organizations, not for them. With them, but not for them. I think that's such an important thing just to, uh, just to know in our mind with a millennial. If you're uh, one of the demographics that are older than a millennial and maybe you have kids or people that you lead that are millennials, that they want to be, they, they want to work with you. They don't want to feel like they're working for you. The staff that I've led for years, different churches, organizations all over the place, I lead other churches um, in some workshops with their staff. These staff do not want to feel like they work for somebody. They want to know that they are part of something, that they have some influence, and that there's a reason that they are there. That work with is so important. Please don't miss that. Please don't miss that. Yeah. Yeah, I would help you emphasize that by just pointing out that's where a lot of the intergenerational conflict comes in the not on the way I'm like all the steps up like, like I did. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's curious of judgment with it, uh, not just that's how they are. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Hopefully you're taking notes on some of this stuff and I can share this chart with you uh, as well. If you, uh, if you need, you can just email me. Uh, Gen Z, career multitaskers. A lot of uh, the Gen Z, now they're younger right now as well. So I know when I was younger, I had multiple jobs as well, but I had multiple jobs because, well, this place would hire me part-time, not full-time. And while I wanted to make a little bit more money and I had free time, I don't even know what free time is anymore, but I had it back then. And so I started mowing lawns and doing other things I could do as a career multitasker. But now Gen Z, one of their values is I don't want to be stuck in just one thing. Even if you offered me 40 hours a week at the pay that I you know, feel like I want or need uh, in life, I want to be able to do multiple things. That's an important thing for a lot of the Gen Z uh, you know, demographic as well. And so attitude career, career, toward career, I love this one, signature products, the automobile, the automobile for Maturis, that's a signature product. That was not that long ago, by the way. The automobile, television for baby boomers. Can you get an amen on that one from you boomers? All right, okay, maybe not. Uh, personal computer for Gen X, I remember when the personal computer came into our house. It was ugly, it was clunky, it didn't do a thing. But we had a computer, right? And then we got dial-up internet. <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, we thought that we were, I mean, now if the you know, if thing spins for three seconds, I'm going, I gotta go down and reset the, I mean, I don't know how we ever were able to, but personal computer, that was so big. And then the smartphone is one of those signature products for millennials, the smartphone. What would we ever do without a smartphone? How many people in the room do not own a smartphone? Raise your hand. Do not. How many of you do not? One. Way to go. Hold out. Hold out. Because he can. Right? Because he can. And that's about it. I mean, it's the supercomputers. Again, we carry them around with us everywhere we go. That's a signature product, absolutely for sure. And then for Gen Z, and these, when I read this list originally, this was you know, a couple of years ago, when I read this list, I thought, what in the world? These are all things of the future, but they're not. These are all things that are happening right now. Nano computing, 3D printing, and driverless cars. Wow. Driverless cars. I'm going to drive a truck, and if I'm not sitting in that passenger seat or that driver's seat, it ain't moving. I'm not sitting in a passenger seat and having something else drive it. This is a signature product for. Be crazy. And this one is so big. If you want to be a great leader, you got to be a great communicator, right? Everybody? And you got to learn how to communicate in between all these generations. That's why it's important for us to be talking about five generations here. So what's the preferred communication medium for maturists? Well, mostly it's formal letter. Now, I'd say a lot of our maturists have adopted most of these along the way. But absolutely uh, in their formative years, formal letter writing. My grandpa still sits down every evening after dinner and he writes some letters. He writes letters to his friends. He mails them out. I get a letter from grandpa. It is like one of the best things ever. I know there's going to be a poem in there that he wrote, right? That he's sending to me. I keep them all. Sometimes it's just packed full of wisdom. And I'm just, I mean, it's like sh shove that in, you know, my notebook so that I can go back to it later. And sometimes it's about the fish that he caught or didn't, about the weather, about going to see someone who I don't even know. I mean, it just seems so superficial, but he took the time to formally write me a letter and he signs every one of them. I know who it came from. I read the, the envelope when it got there, right? He still signs every one of them. Formal letters are such an important thing for this generation that are really gone if you look over toward Gen Z. So you two Gen Zers, last time you wrote a letter, a formal letter. Uh, I actually read a lot. Yeah. So I like to write a letter. This week? Probably last week? Wrote in my journal, not yeah. yeah. Wrote in the journal. Um, probably more like more yeah. Okay. 
something that's going away. It's going away, for sure. Travis, you back then? I love riding him back. Nice. Absolutely love riding him back. Back, and you know, I think um, you know, probably just after college, when I'd write, I and again, my handwriting is atrocious. It really is. I mean, I write with both hands. It just doesn't matter which one, right, for me. And it takes time, and I want to make it to where he can read it because he's getting old, and you know, and all that. It just really takes. It's it's laborious to write it. And so I type it all out and then I print it and then send it. Let me tell you when I send, when I would send him a handwritten one, that's what meant the world to him. So yeah, absolutely write him back for sure. Any, any chance that I can get. My grandparents saved every letter that their five grandchildren ever wrote them. Wow. And when my mom died two years ago, um, we found those letters because she had saved those things mm. when her parents died. So just two years ago, I was reading letters that I wrote to my grandparents when I was like in the second grade. Hmm. We were taught to write thank you notes for every right. single thing we got. And, it, and we were taught how to properly construct a letter by my mother in the first grade. And well, she checked it over before it was mailed. Yeah. And uh, it's, that's a really, that's a lost art. Yeah, I was just gonna say the same words. It's a lost art for sure. It's definitely getting lost a little bit more and more, yeah. How about that? Right, right. Yeah, we're teaching our son how to do all these life skills, right? He's five, and so we're helping him be a little bit more independent, so we don't have to do everything for him, right? We want him to be able to do some things for himself, but he has to ask, ask permission, and so he says, can I go get the mail? And we love this. We, uh, we live a little bit out in the country. It's in a neighborhood, but we've got a little bit of space, and so we kind of have a longer driveway, and he does have to cross the street to go get uh, the mail. But no one goes through our neighborhood anyway, but we always make him stop and, and look both ways and do all these things that seem like normal skills to go get the mail. Um, but he'll, he'll go out and get the mail, stop, he'll look both ways, you know, look back to make sure we're watching that we saw that he looked both ways. Goes across and he gets the mail. And when he comes back, he'll say, okay, dad, this one's for you because he knows what a bill looks like. He just does. This one's for you. He knows, um, you know, that my wife's name starts with an S, right? And so he goes, you know, mom, this one's for you. He loves getting mail from grandparents. I mean, brightens his day like crazy. And I kind of think we lose that so much. We lose that. When I say we can all learn from each other, we, we have to learn from each other. I want to learn from him to go, and when someone who writes me a letter, sends me a card for my birthday, man, that was intentional. They took time out of their lives and they valued me to be able to find the card, write the card, pay crazy amounts now for postage, which still isn't enough because our post office is, you know, what in the world? Like that is such an important thing. I should, I should just bright, you know, my whole life should just brighten up because somebody sent me a letter. And I should brighten up because it's not a bill. That's a good thing uh, as well. But he comes in and then all the advertisements you're just talking, talking about, um, he just goes, oh, these, you know, this is all junk. Yeah. Goes over the recycle bin and puts it all in, right? And we lose that a little bit. Yeah. I've been noticing that uh, with the new technology, people text. Whatever happened to the telephone? I love talking to people. On the phone. Yeah. Everybody texts back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you don't get the real tone of what they're really saying. Yeah. Because when they text, Interesting. the real word. Are they mad? Are they happy? Are they glad? Are they, you know what I mean? Yeah. What, uh, what generation do you fall in? What generation do you fall in on here? Boomers. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's just go there. Baby boomers, the communication media that is so valuable for them is the telephone. The telephone. We always had a phone on the wall. We call it a landline now, right? Like a landline. That's, that's an important thing for boomers for sure. But just pick up the phone and call me. I'll be there, and if not, well, I had other things that are more important. We'll catch up later, or leave me a message on the message machine. I thought about the use the tape. We used to love doing that, erasing mom and dad's message and putting on a different message. I mean, that was the best thing growing up. Mom and dad would be like, "Wait, did I just hear that right? That was the kids." So, yeah. Just going to make as you move across the generations, on that communication um, method, uh, maybe even going a step deeper is how often. 
generations answer or respond or how quickly they open. Mm. Um, I know for our kids, they won't answer their phone if we call them. They won't even respond to a text because they don't. They know that we don't know if they got it or not. Mm -hmm. But if we send them a direct message or a Snapchat and they know that we know they got it, mm -hmm. they'll respond. So um, it's just not only interesting which method, but yeah. you know how deep it goes to the response or how quickly they. Open. Yeah, we're going to get to this in even yet today if we get moving here because this is really important. I, I think that's astute for sure. For sure. Yeah, the party line. Yeah. Heard all about them but don't know anything about them. So. Yeah. A group text. Yeah, it's a, it's a party line. Well, that's the next generation X you know, communication medium is email and text message. If you want to send an email or text message, I'm going to get back to you. That's the thing that just resonates. I mean, those are important for that, uh, you know, that demographic. And again, it doesn't mean that, you know, Gen Z doesn't use email or text. You doesn't use email or text even regularly, but the value that's again, a blanket statement across the generation is, you know, as stated here, email and text. And then Gen Y, your millennials, uh, yeah, you text and you've got your social media. Just send me a text or DM me, right? That was this language that wouldn't have meant anything to a maturist or even a boomer or even a Gen Xer, you know, in their formative years. What do you mean DM me? What do you mean send me a text, right? Yeah. Yep. Does perhaps the communication medium tell us a little about, about the depth of the relationship? It might. It certainly tells us the importance to the receiver, for sure. That's, that's the right? When, when I would hire uh, a staff member, um, you know, we go through the interview process and you got a whole bank of interviews and after the interview it would not be uncommon later that afternoon for me to get an email. Right, an email says, hey, thanks for taking time. And here's, you know, again, reiterate that they want the job and all of that. But when I got somebody who would send me a thank you note, I met a little something more. I'm not going to get to it that afternoon anyway. So they spent time, they took it, they probably hand delivered it into our office. It sat on my desk. It was sitting there waiting for me. And that means it's a little something different because I know it took them time. They really do want this job. Yeah. I think that's also cultural because I'm from Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I did find another chart like this that was from the UK. And actually, one of the big differences was in um, the workforce uh, side of this you know, sort of thing. So if you're working with, with teams that are globally, for sure, some of this changes. This is one that's based on you know, the culture that we've got. Maybe right here. That's a good observation. Let's keep going. Uh, Gen Z handheld communication devices. Pretty soon it's going to be VR and AR and whatever else are, and we'll see where it all uh, where it all goes. But you can look at uh, at this chart if you want this chart. By the way, just email me. Send me an email again. It's Travis at fifthgenconsulting.org. It's five T H genconsulting.org. I'll I'll send you this. It's an interesting uh, thing to have uh, if you're into that uh, sort of thing. Yeah. You know, I was thinking of uh, like in the workplace, they tell you, you you get a you get a text message and you, you respond to fast. And the Holy Spirit sometimes you, you want to like fight back or something and somebody says something. Or you write an email, you can't take those words back. Mm -hmm. it's too fast. You yeah. write a letter. You know what I mean? I think God wants us to slow down a little bit because James talks about our, our tongue gives us some trouble. Uh. My wife always says my tongue gives us some trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's too fast. Yeah. And the text message is way too fast in an email. And if you email, you kind of read it and then maybe delete a few things. Yeah. You know, I think we're getting yeah. ourselves in, in, in uh, wars against other people and we shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. Because we, 
from both ends of the room. You guys are on it. I love this. Love the communication. Love the uh, participation. Here it is. This is the current scene. By the way, all generations, all five that we just looked at, the, you fit into this scene. This is the scene. If you're going to paint a picture of what's happening right now, uh, this is the scene that we're living in for better, for worse, good, bad, the ugly, all those things. This comes from Dr. Tim Elmore, by the way. He is uh, an expert on the millennial generation and Gen Z, and especially leadership to, uh, to these generations. And so if you want uh, specific information about uh, these two generations, particularly, uh, he's one of the foremost experts in that. And he is the one who developed uh, this. I put the graphic together, but this idea came from him. I've used it so many times over the last four or five years even. Uh, here's the current scene and scene is an acronym. And so S stands for speed. You were just talking about it. Man, we are moving at a breakneck speed for better, for worse, all those things. I mean, anyone disagree? Everyone think that we're just going slow. Is, say for the last five months of the pandemic because things have slowed for sure. But the world has changed so much. I mean, just in these five generations that we looked at here, it is absolutely crazy. The speed at which convenience, 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 convenience. I mean, we shop at Trader Joe's, right? We shop there because it has the healthy food that we want to eat and because it doesn't take us an hour to get through the store. There may not be five options for black beans. There's one. And guess how many options I need? I just, I just want the convenience to be able to walk through the four aisles and be done. Let's go. Let's get on with other things. I can order something on my phone from the Amazon app and not even have to enter my credit card, not have to tell it when or where I want it to be there because I know it's going to be on my doorstep before I get home. What? Or I could tell it, don't leave it if I'm not there. Wait for my signature. I can do that all from my phone before the sentence is done. That is convenience at its core, yeah. So my daughters don't even go to the grocery store. Yeah. They order online and they go through the drive-thru and they put it in their car. Yep. They have to take their kids in. Yep. They get what they want and they're gone. Yeah. It saves time. Convenience. We live in a world that values convenience for better or for worse. Entertainment is the first E. S-C-E, entertainment. Anyone think that we live in a world that is focused on entertainment? Crazy industry, the entertainment industry. Things that you don't even know are entertaining you or designed to entertain you are there to entertain you. We live in the highest stimuli environment that has ever been, ever. Since the beginning of, we started Genesis 1-1, right? Until now, the highest stimuli environment ever, even if you live in a rural area. But man, the more metro that you get, the more stimuli you may have. It is all around us all the time. The studies of how often people look at their phones makes you sick. I get a weekly report, you know, on my iPhone that says, oh, your weekly usage is up or down. And my goal every week is like, oh, let's just make it go down, right? Let's just make my weekly uses go down. I use it for work. I use it for entertainment. I use it for babysitting when I absolutely have to get something done, right? Like, I mean, we use our phones for everything. Entertainment is all around us. It's geared toward us. There's this value for entertainment. The next uh, letter is N, nurture. Nurture. We live in a highly nurturing environment all around us that hadn't been before. I mean, my kids need to check in before they go to the mailbox, right? When I was a kid, I mean, I would think maybe seven or eight years old, got my first like actual bike, real bike. It was freedom. You know, my son got his first actual bike. He doesn't have freedom. He can't just ride around the neighborhood. That's not safe in today's world, right? I used to ride to my grandparents' house miles away to the friend's house, whatever. I didn't call and check in. I didn't have, uh, you know, track my phone, you know, on when I was there. There's no low jacking for, you know, for me when I was a kid, but we can low jack our kids now. We can know how long until they get home. We live in this highly nurturing environment. If my kid's going down to the, uh, to the mailbox, you know, I want him to wear his helmet and his knee pads. 
right? I mean, this is the world that we live in. It's a highly nurturing uh, environment. And there are some great things that have come out of that as well. So again, for better, for worse, the last E is entitlement. Somebody give me an amen on that one. I mean, we live in a, high, a world just as so focused on entitlement. People want to come out of college and just have their dream job at their dream salary in the corner office. And some of them get that. And some of them deserve that. And we need to learn from what that looks like. Some of them need to maybe go through the process a little bit, like others of us. Or not. Right? Now, there's also a negative assumption to each of these, which is kind of the little letters. I hope you can see some of this as well. It's so hard to know um, what kind of environment we're going to be in. Uh, but the negative assumption to speed is that slow is bad. And this goes along with the scene that we live in today. Slow is bad. If there's something that takes a while, it's probably not worth doing or giving your attention to or value. If, if it takes time to develop something, well, by the time that it's actually developed, the world's going to already move on. It's going to be obsolete. I've heard that. I see that all around us. Is slow bad? Well, this is the scene that we're living in. Slow is bad. That's the negative assumption. Convenience the negative assumption is that anything that's hard is bad, right? If it's hard to walk through the store or hard to pick from a hundred options or hard to take your kids into the grocery store, well, there's, that's got to be bad because there's a better option, an easier option where I could just hit the button. I don't even have to get out to see the, the lift gate on my van open up and they can just put the groceries in the back. It's already paid for. They close it and I'm on my way. My kids didn't get hot or cold or cranky or convenience. The negative part is bad. Entertainment. Boring is bad. I mean, I remember as a kid walking up onto the hillside, going for a hike from my grandparents' house. They lived up on the top of a hill, overlooked the ocean. It's beautiful. And I used to walk up, you know, hike up to the top and just sit on a tree stump right, for hours. And we'd look up there and we'd carve things with our knives and, you know, we'd... I don't know what we did. We were just being out there, right? Like that was part of just what life looked like. And if you go back generations before me, even more so. But now, generations now, there's something that's right at my fingertips, right? There's some kind of entertainment that's right here that I could be doing. That I could be connecting with friends or that I could be seeing. I was to, say about, to you about that. Yeah. Yeah. So what we changed our whole worship service, we you know sing one song like half of it, and he goes right into the sermon. Yeah. And that's just the way because it's boring. That's yep. Right. One of the uh, one of the experts in uh, in church communication has said that we are now living in the biggest communication shift that has happened in five hundred years. Five hundred years. If you don't get to it, they gone. If you're online, I hope you're still with us. <laughs> right? Okay, entitlement. Let's go to this last one. Labor is bad. That's the negative assumption that labor is bad. If it takes hard work, well, man, there's something I could be doing that doesn't take all that hard of work. So that must not be the best thing. Let me go find something that's a little easier. So this is the scene that we live in, speed, convenience, entertainment, nurture, and entitlement. And whether you like it or whether you don't like it, when we walk out these doors, this is the scene you're walking into. Paint the picture in your mind right now, and this is it. And so as we lead in love to the world all around us and to our families and to those that we work with, this is the scene that you're leading in. And it's kind of a foundation for where we can go with this thing throughout the rest of the week. I love this interaction, by the way. I do not want this to be an hour of me just talking to you. I want it to be an hour of us doing community. That's why it's called community. So this is great. So let's just talk for a couple of minutes here. Where do you want to go with this week? What, what are you hoping to get? When you read 5G Leadership, and there's a couple other great communities, right? With some great leaders, you're sitting in this room. So what is it that you're like, I would really love if we touch on or if I walked away knowing a little bit about this? Yeah. So I'd like to know um, in team building, whether it's in church where you're building ministry teams or whether it's in the business world and, and you're building teams, how do you um, uh, kind of uh, build into the 
strengths of each of those five generations um, and help them communicate well together and, and use their different perspectives to kind of push toward the same goal. So I've got a... Um a talk on a, uh, that I, I actually lead a lot of churches through and I've led our staff through. It's a five section profile. Uh, it's about knowing yourself and then knowing how knowing yourself can affect how you know other people. If you know yourself really well and I know myself really well and we have good communication about each of those things, then when you say something, I actually know what you mean by it. And I know before I say something as I lead you that uh, I should maybe frame it this way in order for it to be most effective to you. That may be a good place for us to go is team with teams, team building. And so I'm going to write down five section profile as an option. Let's see where that goes. Yeah. In the back. Within the church have a uh, connect generation where they learn from and with each other and we get the benefits and the strengths of what they have and the generations instead of the segregation of generations, which can be the only paradigm in churches. But, uh, yeah. Do that where we get to specialize at some times and also connect with those totally unlike us. Yeah, that's so good for the video. Uh, he's talking about connecting these different generations, uh, especially in the church. And do we uh, focus on one generation or specialize to a generation? Or um, how do we effectively reach all these generations that are present in our ministries? There's a hand up here somewhere. Yeah, and mine was similar to yours. Okay. It seems that um, we don't know how to connect the older and the younger. And a lot of our churches are focusing on one generation. And those are the people coming up who have children. Yeah. We were the future. But I want to know as I'm kind of the baby boomer, I want to know where our spot should be, where do we fit? Because it seems like we don't fit as well anymore as we get older. The church doesn't seem to have the same views for us, but we actually have a lot to offer. That's good. Where do I fit? Especially for for boomers. I told you my handwriting's bad, but can you read it? <laughs> we're going. We're happening. Yeah, in the back. So right this way. Uh, sure. <laughs> you just want to see if I can do it, or yeah. you want to see what it looks like? It's on the old team where guys write two pages, each page with a hand. I've taught some classes, uh, and I practiced to be able to do it, but I'd write my first name and my last name at the same time across the board. And my left hand would always go down this way by the time my right hand was kind of steady like that, but they'd look up at me like, uh, it was a good way to start the class. It's just icebreaker and whatever, but I'll write it. What, yeah. what you got? So our church is uh, in, in the process right now of working on some strategic planning issues. Okay. And it's all about what we consider to be growing young. So we're in this, this small community, a lot of mature boomer type people in the church, not a lot of the, the other side of the, of the chart, right, disease working. Okay. So our thought is, is, you know what, if we don't change in 20 years from now, this church might not even exist. Right. And so maybe you can get some guidance on how can we reach out in the communities and bring in some of that younger generation. Okay, that's that's good. Growing young, I like that, uh, that language. That is, uh, those things that others in churches are dealing with as well, that's an interesting place that we can go for sure. Okay, yeah. Sounds like an easy talk. <laughs> There's someone, yeah? Me too. It's important to understand how we view church differently. Ooh. One generation might see it as, you know, this was where everything social happened. And it was kind of an internal, people came to us. Yeah. Where the younger generations view it as, no, we go out yeah. to people. And so then there's this not understanding that they're coming from different places. Sure. So it's uh, the view on churches from different generations. Um, and what does that mean for us as a church? What's, what's the application? How do we shift that? One more. Uh, this might, this must not be what God called 
Uh huh. There's a different level of, of dedication uh -huh. to leadership. How do you draw and build um, that into leaders? It's this uh, sticky leadership. Is how I'm going to write uh, write that. How do you make leadership stick? why of the local church we will not get to all of these so there's my promise uh and you know we'll see where all that uh where all this goes as we continue to uh work our way through the week but this is awesome some of uh this is was already a bit planned uh as well or hopeful uh for sure so we're going to wrap this up if you um if you have things that you want to add to this list catch me i'll be around throughout conference i'll try to uh, be around uh, to, to be available to you. If you want to chat a little more one-to-one, -one, I'm good with that uh, as well. So again, come find me. Send me an email if you're an emailer. Uh, send me an email. It's Travis at fifthgenconsulting.org. Love to, um, to respond uh, to that as well. And uh, we can go from, from there. And then also, I want to learn from you. So the expectation is with some of these things that I may just throw out a question. Let's have a discussion about it. And I can kind of lead some of that uh, discussion more as a moderator than necessarily a presenter. Okay, it's community all together, which means uh, you have a lot uh, that we can all learn from. So be thinking about that. Be thinking about some of these topics. If you brought it up, I want to hear from you, right? This is really, really good. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to be done because I think they have a tour coming through here pretty quickly. Shortly. All right. Um, God, this time, and it was, it was your time. Uh, God, this space is a holy space. And I pray that the, uh, the things that we talked about here, that the, uh, the topics that we discussed, the things that you've put on our hearts uh, would be things that honor you, that we would grow in them so that we can make a difference. Again, God, I pray that we would understand the importance of being a leader so that we can love those around us, whether they're like us or as different as the day is young, that we can just love each other like you called us to love each other and that we can love those outside of our circles as well and that they would know who you are through that love. That's our hope. That's our desire as we move through this week. We love you. We thank you for this time. Amen. Amen.